respect and responsibility. The think tank platform um, can have very defined rights in terms of access, in terms of freedom of expression, etc. But they also have uh, the responsibility mainly to respect the other people's rights. And then you can start to um, discuss dispute settlement and um, um, other ways to start to really um, yeah, get in a, in a public arena and, and to involve the users as um, um, citizens in that particular environment. Um, and so far, we have had very positive feedback from the community. We haven't had a first dispute, so um, you know some of the mechanisms are still out for for trial. But um, we think this might be an interesting way to get away from the very one-sided, um, uh, you know, uh, users accepting the terms of service that are presented to them by um, the platform providers and have a more inclusive and, uh, and uh, equal footing. Um, amongst each other on a platform. Thanks, Max. That's some really, really interesting different tactics here, and and, uh, and some that are effective, some that are not, and, and it'll be interesting to break that down a little bit more. But before we do that, maybe we can sort of get a little bit more uh, hands-on and sort of real-life examples uh, from, from the side of, of the activist here. Uh, Juan Carlos, you want to uh, take us through sort of the experience from Brazil? So, um, bom, uh, bom, <laughs> Portuguese. Let us think about this. The my experience in Brazil. Uh, we are uh, in Brazil. We uh, I'm advertising. I'm advertising professional. I forget to, to say this, just because as advertising, uh, I observe the the behavior of the people, the behavior of the society, the behavior of the matches. Well, based on our experience in Brazil, the first one is to fight against the the, the, PE, the, the, the cyber crime bills that was based on the Budapest Convention. Uh, but this project is too bad for our society that, that they tried to put them on a uh, on layer of surveillance very bigger to Brazil. And we fight hard against this, and this project goes, uh, was stopped for two years. Um, now this project is still alive, is still running on the Congress, just because uh, we fought the, the hide agenda that turned this so bad. We win one battle. Another battle that we win won in Brazil. As is based on that our fight to against this project and the need to to place something to regulate the internet the minister of justice and the fundação getulio vargas and the others actors started on project of the open consultation about the one civil rights frameworks bill to warrant the, our rights in the internet. Just the, the idea is to start the, the regulation of the internet in Brazil for the civil rights and not for the door of the jail. It appears to be work, just this battle is so hard. On this battle, uh, we observed some stuff interesting just because the people, normal people don't engage on chaos, on chaos, don't they, the, if the chaos don't take their out of the comfort zone. Just the police, police uh, people do something without this threat. Curious, uh, we perceive that the, I don't know if this behavior is just on Brazil or just the behavior is for the people all around the world. The, but our observation is the people is more uh, react more intensity. Inten uh, um, it's more easy to mobilization against something that mobilization in favor of other. For example, the mobilization against the cybercrime bill is more was more strong than the mobilization in favor of the civil rights framework. Another curious uh, stuff is this. Uh, 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 
the basically on this we need to for, for example to identify the threats to positive agendas and mobilize uh, and uh, keep the, the 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 people mobilize, mobilized against the street for example in brazil nowadays the telecommunication companies don't want the civil rights framework as uh, with the, the the current text just because the current text uh, puts inside the project the warranty of the net neutrality in brazil and the tele telecommunications companies don't want the net neutrality. The, the telecommunications company in Brazil wants these civil rights removals to be voted just before the WCT, which will be in the, the beginning of December in Dubai. Uh, what the practice we, we observed on our uh, daily activities is to split some agenda to, to in different uh, points of view, just to fit the different niche needs. For example, uh, if you are, you ha if you has one project, or if you has one practice, or if you has one treat to internet that fits that are more complex, uh, it's difficult to show up to people uh, how this could be. Co uh, how, how where is the treat? Where the, is the hidden agenda? Or wha uh, how how good it will be for his for he or she. Based on the uh we need to split this agenda into short. Uh, this uh, could be the Twitterization of the agendas. We can show uh, identify the points of interest for different niches, and based on this point of interest, we could engage these peoples on our cause uh, or our in our policies. Uh, other observation we did is uh, based on, on ev uh, everyday surprising with the digital activists. We are digital immigrants. We are everybody here is digital immigrants. Just because we are working with internet for the age of the internet. We are working on internet for, for example, for 18 years I, I working. Just I don't see the internet. Looks at uh, some uh, some guy or some girl with uh, 18 years. The digital actives use the internet different for us, and the the internet different for us. And basically, on my observations. Uh, I, I saw some interesting, interesting uh, uh, behavior is that the, 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 uh, the internet turned some things very easy. And one thing is to be uh, that internet turns easy is the, uh, the practice of mobilization, the practice of the engage and unengage for one cause. Just the, uh, the internet could uh, do... Um, Zygmunt Bauman, as the told the 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 liquid word the the, the word uh, over oh, stop that. <laughs> Sigmund Bauman told the the the, the postmodern culture uh, is the the culture of fast fast food. Based on the, this this uh, digital actives are the, the the guys which are. Uh, more easy to mobilize, just more difficult to keep energized and on the uh, some kind of cause. Uh, we need to identify the, the way of doing it. Just when it's difficult, just because we don't know who they are. Okay, but. If very interesting, sort of the, this, the distinction you highlight between uh, the differences in mobilizing, um, you know, around sort of in a reactive style to sort of the proposals for the Budapest uh, Convention type uh, law uh, in Brazil and, and sort of a more positive agenda like the Marco Civil. Uh, do you have to use different tactics when engaging users on, on sort of positive versus negative legislation? See, yes. It's more easy to engage something about, uh, uh, against something, against some uh, treat. 
on in purpose TV agenda, uh, we need to understand, identify all the the great benefits with this agenda could be do in favor of the peoples, or we need to identify the treats for this agenda. For example, I, I, I saw on the, Marcus, the, the civil rights framework that the telecommunication companies are the treats. So the people are had uh, the mobilization against these uh, telecommunication companies are going increasing fast just because uh, I need to identify uh, the, the work on this, and working on the contrad contradictory, or the, the, the positive agenda, we need to fit the, the treats of this agenda just to fight f against. That's the, the, the uh, perhaps the, the our tendency to minim 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 minimization of the the behaviors, the, the the good against the bad, or something like this. But but fundamentally, you're you're still relying primarily on a Twitter-based campaign for both initiatives. F fundamentally, you're still using sort of a Twitter-based sort of advocacy for for both the Marco Civil and for uh, around this the Budapest Convention law. Um. Okay. No, uh, Twitter is uh, good to 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 do the uh, cy cyber activism just because we do just not the the one way. I did it for through Facebook, the Twitter, uh, blogs. Um, but but are, th are there differences between how you engage around a positive agenda versus uh, in, in, in a negative. response to a negative initiative? Yes, uh, Twitter is, the, is more quick. Uh, the, the answer is more quick on Twitter. Uh, in the, it's more easy to, to start a mobilization, to start on some, some meme uh, on the Twitter and bring something to, to top trends. No? But uh, Twitter is, is so fast, so intense. But Twitter is not the; uh, it's just the the, the, the entrance, the, the door to to go into the, the the mobilization. Just because we need to understand, the the people want more. The Twitter is short. The Facebook uh, is a social network; is a wall garden. Uh, but we work inside there. But in, 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 we need to interest in just to to use the blogs to to post text in different kind of visions to uh, stimulate the people to post against uh, or, or in favor of some stuffs. Uh, the practice of the collective post is uh, normal on our houses. Uh, it is uh, this have a structure if the Google understand you just because. For example, when the, we start f talking about the cybercrime bills, when we do the search on Google, for example, we will just find quickly reasons to vote. We, we, we did uh, uh, intense uh, collective postings on blogs and invert this. When do you, you find Google for cybercrime bills in Brazil, we find some reasons to no vote against this. Or this, the, the, this could be uh, done just using other tools than Twitter, than Facebook. We are, we, 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 you use it to blogs to, to modify the results, they modify the perception of the user online or the facts. Joanne, you look like you want to get in here. <laughs> it's not a specific response, although. Um, I think that Carlos had made a really good point earlier, which was to, um, I forgot exactly how you said it, but it was basically this divide between digital natives and the, the sort of short attention span that they have. Um, and I, I want to ask the room, how many of you have heard of Ethan Zuckerman's cute cat theory? Anyone? Okay, we've got a couple. So I'll give you, uh, there, there's kind of two parts to it, but the part that really resonates with me uh, per this discussion is the idea that people are not going to care about censorship until it personally affects them. And so what's missing so far from this discussion is 
I mean, we understand the tactics, we understand, I think, largely how these things work, but why? Why do people get involved? And I'm going to use a couple examples, and then I'm going to push back on something you said, but I'm going to separate that from this. So, so the first is, um, I think most people are familiar, um, it was mentioned in the video, with the mobilization last year in the U.S. against uh, SOPA and PIPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act. And... What was interesting about that to me is that one of the provisions contained within, uh, I think both acts, but maybe it was just one of them, pardon my memory, um, was an anti-circumvention provision that Americans would you know, sort of be barred from using these tools. And what was interesting about that, of course, is that these same tools, uh, circumvention tools, to get around censorship are largely bought and paid for by the US government. And so uh, different, different strands of government, of course, but still, um, and so what was interesting to me about that is that, you know, the, the, the broad U.S. population doesn't pay attention to these circumvention technologies because it's not personal. These are people, you know, we're, by, we're, we're funding these technologies for people in Iran or people in um, Tunisia, historically. Uh, we're not thinking about people in our own country, and so people don't care. And then this bill comes along, SOPA and PIPA, these two different bills, and people care, but not because their freedom is at risk. I mean, it, it still is freedom, mind you, but because their content is at risk. And so the reason that people mobilized around that was because they were afraid of losing their access to music, to, um, you know, to videos, etc. I mean, granted, it does go beyond that. There are a lot more threats involved, but what m caused people to react in that case and in the case of ACTA, more in so in Europe, was this idea about content. And so I think that's where it comes to this generation. We, my generation, younger, are a generation that, we're the Napster generation. You know, we grew up with this idea that we had some sort of different access to content than our parents or what have you. So I'm assuming that most people are fairly familiar with the tactics that were used during the SOPA and PIPA protests, but the, the short version is um, that uh, an activist network with, um, you know, collaborating with Google and Wikipedia and some of these big sites uh, did a blackout where, you know, you would put a, block, a black page up on the site explaining why you were blacking out that day. Google did a, a modified version, but nonetheless, we had a large multi-stakeholder approach to a negative uh, phenomenon. And so then the blackout, the concept of the blackout, the tactic of the blackout started spreading to other countries. First we saw, uh, I, I know I'm gonna miss one in here, but the two that I'm thinking of are Jordan and the Philippines. In Jordan, it was um, a different story. It wasn't so much about content, it was about fear of, of losing one's online freedom. Um, it was this idea that the government was going to come in and you know, block websites, and it was around a certain uh, I don't need to get into details, but the, the impetus was different than in the U.S. And in the Philippines, it was also different because you were looking at a country that had a strong history of um, uh, martial law. And so the fact that this contained defamation provisions terrified people. And, and the Philippines has a strong culture of um, press freedom initiatives. And so you had this, this sort of fear tactic. Um, and that was how the activists responded largely, at least from my outsider's perspective. I watched a lot of the language being used in those tactics, um, kind of responding to that historical um, feeling of fear. And so I think that that's what's really important is if you're talking about engaging users, you have to do it on their level. And so, yes, the tactics are important. I mean, you can look at uh, some of the historical examples. I think Tunisia is a great example where you had some really creative tactics over the years. Um, but what they spoke to was what everyone knew. Everyone knew that there was this heavy censorship and everyone, well not everyone, but the internet community at large opposed it. Um, and so whatever tactic was being used at the time, it spoke to that level of people, the people who were in favor of internet freedom. And I think that that's the important thing to keep in mind. Now, on a totally separate note, um, you raised something that I hadn't thought of before the panel, so I apologize for the, I'm gonna elbow you here. Um, you were talking about user-generated governance, um, the policing of content um, on, on platforms like Google or Facebook or what have you. And I was bothered by a recent example, which was, um, because it's a Google one, that's why I'm bringing it up, it was when YouTube uh, decided proactively, without a court order, to block a video in Egypt that had stirred up a lot of uh, sentiment. Now, 
I don't want to talk about the content because I realize that this is a very controversial issue, and I think that when we're talking about a government level, um, there's a you know, multitude of solutions. Some governments choose to block YouTube entirely, some send a court order, but in this case, it was YouTube that blocked, not a government. And the issue that I have with that is that there was no engagement with civil society on that issue. And so, whereas civil society has the ability to respond to governments, they don't always have the ability to respond to corporations. And in this case, what we saw coming out of Egypt was um, at least two human rights organizations standing up and saying, Google, we fought so hard for our freedom of expression. We're still not there yet. Why are you coming in and taking it away from us? Um, and I think that that's a really strong point because if I look at all of the examples over the years that I've seen, I really have no mechanism with which to engage with Facebook or Google. Now, I do because, right, I'm sitting here. So I'm sitting here next to someone from Google. I talk to someone from Google. That puts me in a very privileged position. But I'm not the average user, and I recognize that. And so if you think about the average user and their ability to engage with a corporation and the degree to which corporations are now controlling our content, I think that that's another point that we really need to think about is how do you engage users in more of a, um, a back and forth mutual relationship as uh, Google seems to be doing in Germany, which I think is a great idea, of course. Um, and so I'd like to, you know, just, I'd like to just ask that openly. Um, and with that, I will. So thanks for bringing it up. I think it was um, one of the um, most prominent examples, certainly um, recently, and uh, it was one um, of the causes why I brought up um, the tolerance point, uh, and not only to speak about uh, freedom of expression, because I think you know, in a world where each um, you know neo-Nazi video, all the disgusting things that you can imagine are also on the tip of, uh, on, on your fingertips. Um, we really have to um, uh, not only think about where the um, borders of freedom of expression are, but also at how do we deal with all the things that, um, you know, one um, uh, group of people might take as uh, funny, like the life of Brian, and others find very offensive and um, it causes a lot of violence. So um, in that context, I think that, um, we all agree that uh, there needs to be exceptions to all rules, and I think in that particular case, um, it was a very difficult decision, and it, and it went back and forward, and we're still discussing internally on how to um, handle cases like that in the future, and I, I can go into that in, in a second. But I really think that um, um, uh, Mohammed video was an exception to the rule, and um, it was not uh, preemptive, actually. The, the video has obviously been flagged by uh, many users, so um, uh, you can dispute whether um, it did, as uh, these users felt, um, didn't comply with the community guidelines of um, uh, YouTube, of course, but um, uh, that um, uh, we, we have been, uh, received a lot of signals that it would, and um, uh, after a while, not initially, that's right, and it depends on from country to country. It's a very complicated case indeed. Um, there have been court orders also to, to take it down. And having all that said, um, uh, Google has um, started an organization together with um, Microsoft and Yahoo called the Global Network Initiative. Uh, that is exactly um, the environment, I think, where um, rules and, uh, and practices in that area are designed and should be designed. And um, uh, as said, um, uh, it's a difficult um, area, and we certainly look into how to develop a clean and transparent process on how these kind of um, uh, cases are handled. If I may just have a quick response. First, I would say the Global Network Initiative only deals with government response. It does not deal with terms of service issues, so this would not be relevant, and Google said that. It deals with privacy and freedom of expression issues. It's it not only limited deals, to government. It is limited to governments. I'm, I'm on the email list, and that was a conversation that happened. And so this is an issue where I think that it does need to go further. But the other thing that I would say um, is that on a fundamental level, not as a Google representative, do you feel that, and I, I can open this not just to you, but to others, I mean, is that a situation where um, users from a given country, I mean, do you feel that they're genuinely being represented and that, uh, and that they're able to engage? And I don't just mean the majority that sit there and flag all day because lots of people try to game that system. I mean, is there actually an opportunity for users to engage with corporations on issues like that in a more balanced way, because what was not represented in that case was human rights organizations from Egypt. 
So I think it's a, a really good conversation to have, and it's actually also exactly the right forum to have it. Um, so to um, your last point, I think, um, yes, it is possible to uh, um, talk with corporations on these subjects, and uh, I'm glad to have the conversation. Um, with regards to, you know, where are the limits of freedom of expression, I think that is one of the absolute crucial and um, one of the very, very difficult questions we have today. I mean, um, uh, if, if you sort of had this kind of user um, uh, freedom of expression governance and uh, you, we, we would only count the um, flaggings and the um, uh, opinions in these countries where the, the violence was happening, I think um, the video would have been taken down absolutely no question. The question is whether um, US-based companies or Western uh, companies um, feel that they have to uphold a higher level of freedom of expression and to um, basically define what is um, uh, the, uh, acceptable and what is not. And I think that balance is very, very difficult to strike. I just want to put another question to the panel. Um, uh, I'm thinking here, the example that you open a platform for users to comment on terms of service. I want to um, move a, a step um, behind that. Um, don't you think that sometimes to engage, there is, a, uh, as uh, Julia mentioned, there is a need that the user feel this violation. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm Brazilian, I'm talking from like Latin American perspective. We are now debating laws on, on pr privacy laws on the internet, net, net neutrality, and deciding the framework, a very important framework, um, but most of the users are, are not aware of it, and they don't even know that, that those kinds of decisions can affect, it, it will affect in the future, and maybe it will be too late or more difficult to engage and change the situation. So. Um, what do you think we, we should do with um, a work of translation uh, of, of uh, that is required for engagement? Because I feel like, for instance, uh, and as uh, João said, uh, Caribe said, uh, for, for the cybercrime bill, we had a huge mobilization because the violation was evident, and it became evident because of the translation that activists did uh, of, of these draft bills, no? Um, but, for instance, all the debate on ITU, users don't know that, and, and it's a big thing. So I, I would like to have your inputs on that. Um, I'm trying to work with this. This is like a, a bug in my ear every day, that's why I'm going to for videos. I don't know if it's going to work as I want to, but uh, I just want to have some inputs on, on this question. Yeah, um, oh, <laughs> there. Um, I think the ITU is a great example, and I think that there are also a lot of examples from national, uh, national bills, um, bills at the country level, where not only do the users not understand the bill, but I think many of the writers or co-writers don't understand the bill, and, and that's what we saw with SOPA. And that's also why it was so easy to shoot down in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, the ITU stuff, I mean, I, I can say I work in this field and I still don't completely get it. I'm admitting this on, you know, uh, in the, in the IGF. Yes, I am. I'm publicly admitting it. I, I don't completely understand all of the issues with it. Um, and that's a problem. If I don't, then you can't imagine that my grandmother does, right? I'm a terrible example, I know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I think that that is an issue. And I, I think that, so the question then is, whose role is it to act as intermediary and engage with the broader public over these debates. And I think that that's where NGOs come in. I also think that in some ways this is where corporations come in um, because we have seen corporate mobilization around some of these bills or the ITU. Um, actually, a better I think Pakistan's even a better example of that where corporations did get very involved in, in that discussion. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I think that on some level, um, 
things like JNI are a good platform for that. I think on another level, though, um, we do have to sort of act as as arbiters and translators um, to the broader public. And you know, in, in a way that like that sort of bothers me in my head. This idea that I have to to translate a bill because the people don't understand, but. I barely understand, and so if, if you're coming at it from that perspective, um, I think user engagement also happens at this intermediary NGO level as well. So, in my point of view, um, and I share the the urge and the um, you know necessity that um, you described. I still think that um, we we should um, not haste things and um, you know try to to find a solution so quickly. Basically. Um, the existence of this uh, very um, uh, institution, the Internet Governance Forum, um, was based on the fact that civil society and um, the private sector, um, uh, one using, the other one um, organizing the Internet, told the diplomats and the government representatives to you know, hold back, do some capacity building, etc. And then we can get, once we have a better dialogue, we can um, come together and find better solutions. So um, I think we are on a, on a very good track here. Um, to um, uh, respond to both of your um, <coughs> sentiments, I think um, it is an exponential um, co complexity. We, are, we live in a very complex uh, setup, especially um, when it comes to internet policy, because it always touches on technology, business, it touches on human rights and uh, civil rights, and of course it touches on uh, sovereignty of states and of policymakers. So it's a, it's a very, very um, complex scenario, and basically to do sound policies you have to understand all of them, and this is why a forum like this is so important, where people are speaking with each other and listening to each other and understanding the different viewpoints. Nevertheless, I think uh, we have still some ways to go in terms of capacity building um, in the different uh, regions and stakeholder groups, and in general, um, the think tank that I've mentioned before, the Internet and Society Collaboratory, um, we have tackled things like uh, governance systems for informational goods. We have um, deliberately not chosen the word copyright, because because I think it's very difficult if you start with this system that we have right now to come up with a solution for the um, information age. And we have tackled privacy and security and, um, uh, and publicness. And interestingly enough, we had um, folks from the most um, hardcore German DPA that you can imagine, and we had post-privacy um, uh, activists. And both sitting um, together in a room, we identified the challenges and the transformations that are happening. And you know, despite all public outcry about Google and about you know the data, um, um, the uh, supposedly um, bad uh, policies that uh, we have, I, I think you know companies like Google and uh, and others are really interested in solving problems that are out there. It's a transformation that um, none of us have a, have an easy solution to. And I think just to shut down a lot of the product and say, well, th then let's just uh, don't use it or let's don't uh, innovate further can't be the right uh, way forward. So um, I think we are actually with the current status quo and the approach to experiment and pilot and learn from that, you know, not making big changes all of a sudden, um, we are actually on a very good road. And um, maybe to comment uh, for one second on um, what is reformable and needs reform in this um, format of the IGF. It's really that the agenda setting um, is already working quite fine. I think people are learning from each other and taking back um, new topics that they put on the agenda. What um, might be improved is sending out um, actual um, uh, mandates for other organizations and other institutions to come up with solutions and report back the next year. So um, we are actually seeing progress, as uh, Vin Cerf said yesterday, it needs to be tracked what is going on, otherwise we are debating in a, in a vacuum and that can't be very helpful too. Uh, this question is not re re exactly on the, the team, but just because uh, for Google, for you. On Brazil, uh, on Google representative said an uh, interview that about the civil rights frameworks, uh, suggesting two points of this project. One point is the net neutrality. Other point is the content, third-party content, about the third-party content. And the interview, uh, let us understand that the position of the Google of the, this, the, the Google is about this project is to keep out the question of the net neutrality, just uh, and vote the question for the third-party content. This, uh, the question is 
and is still unanswered for me until now. What's the position of the Google, really the position of the Google about the net neutrality for everyone? I'm not sure I understood the third party aspect that uh, you mentioned, but I'm happy to um, uh, try to answer the first part. You can um, uh, ask again if I didn't answer uh, the third party aspect. So net neutrality is an um, important debate, but it's also a very contested debate. By now, I think uh, pretty much everybody and their mother have agreed that they are for net neutrality and that it's a very important subject. So I think, you know, um, by sheer means of having 10,000 different definitions, um, it's very difficult to say this is um, what Google thinks is um, the right way to reach it because we, ha we haven't even agreed on what it is exactly that we want to reach. And um, additionally, um, the point is that, uh, you know, the, the debate is very different from country to country. It has a lot to do with um, users having a choice between different um, 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 uh, network providers. So in Germany, for example, there is a, a wide array of um, providers that are actually operating on the same network, on the Deutsche Telekom network. So we don't really see a problem if one of these providers says, you know, we are experimenting with a new way of um, offering our service. However, if um, we're talking in the United States and there's areas where you only have one provider, then of course it is very important to make sure that that provider um, enables everybody to access the same content, etc. Um, having that said, I think that um, the road that um, we are actively pursuing, and uh, quite frankly, you know, while we are an active participant in the in the debate, we're we're not uh, a target or um, you know an actor that is, is is directly involved. We're we're commenting, but it's not uh, our debate. I think um, it's it's for the telcos to d to um, decide and take positions there. But I think what is very important and a contribution that we are making is the M Lab effort, the measurement lab where, um, again, every user has the possibility to test whether he receives the packages, the speed, et cetera, that uh, he's paying for. And by crowdsourcing that um, approach to data, you can really make a good map of what are you getting and how the current situation is. And I think um, for, for many aspects, to have very clear transparency why your connection is the way it is, is a, is a big part of the solution. If you ask me personally, I would like to see if a Skype call gets dropped or you know if um, there are problems with the connectivity, I would be happy to see, okay, this is a video call, we have downgraded you to audio because there is a, you know, a, um, a traffic overflow in Chile or somewhere. As long as I know why it is happening and I can um, prove and like, uh, verify and prove that that is the case, I would be already much happier than I am now. So I, I did this question just because you told before about the engagement for the user and the company and the corporations. And uh, yes, the, the best, the, the transparency is the, the best way to to keep these user engaged. Just uh, if you, know, you don't really understand the, the policy or the intentions of the company, uh, it's difficult to keep the users uh, connected to you. So because in, in our streams, we were the partners on the causes, we, we need to clear this. That's the, uh, the reason I did this question for you. Just to, to keep our conversation focused uh, on tactics, um, sort of in regards to MLAB, which, which is a fantastic uh, and really very powerful project in terms of the amount of data it collects, um, what is being done to sort of engage users to actually sort of make use of these tools? Um, and if the answer is not much, then what could be done or what could be done more? Well, <laughs> I mean, like all um, uh, projects of, the, of uh, that type, I think it uh, depends on everybody. It depends on you. It depends on us. I recommend it to all my friends. I mean, um, as, as he said, you know, this is um, kind of Google never defines uh, projects in that way, but uh, it's kind of a corporate social responsibility project because uh, Google is not involved in that subject per se, but we just think that it's a, it's a good approach. So, um, you know, I don't know whether you're, you're suggesting we should go and spend uh, big budgets on marketing. That's not what we plan to do. I think this <laughs> is, um, you know, an effort that we all share together and we should, um, uh, you know, do what the Internet is good at. Uh, share it, talk about it and prove that it's work and uh, worth our time. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that uh, products like that are great, but it, it is true. I mean, I think you can only engage the user in so far as they, they feel that it's something they need. Um, you know, I actually do feel like it's something I need, but I usually use, uh, what's that other site, Speed Test, right? And so I actually didn't really know about this, and so that's great. Now I do. Let's educate the users. Um, but I, you know, I think that, like, this product, this particular product aside, because I can see its utility, I think that um, we often have these platforms and products that, you know, I might find very useful, but there, there, is, no, there is no extensive engagement because the impetus just isn't there. And so I think that that's, I mean, it, from a design perspective, I think it's really important to think about the user in every case. But also, I mean, I think when you're designing movements, when you're designing campaigns, um, are you actually, is what you're saying actually resonating with maybe not even a majority, but a majority of the, the let's say, even just a majority of the human rights community? If I can uh, throw one recommendation out, the, the Yes Man, um, a pretty good um, uh, arts and activist group. They have uh, a website, uh, the, the Yes Lab, and there is uh, a number of um, very good resources and a very structured way of planning campaigns and, uh, and artistic political interventions. I wonder if we could switch gears here and maybe go back a little bit to, to government engagement. Um, Dari Bez spoke a little bit about uh, the Marcus Civil earlier, um, but I, I think what's what's interesting and, and notable uh, about the Marcus Civil is the, the extent that the government has actually um, engaged uh, users around the country um, in consultations around this sort of Internet Bill of Rights, and which I think is notable in that it's sort of one of the first pieces of legislation internationally that's really tried to take that sort of rights-based approach to... to um, to internet policy. Um, Joanna, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that experience of what has worked, what has not worked over the last uh, two, three years. Yeah, with uh, the Marco Civil experience and also for drafting a, a private bill in Brazil, we have been uh, lucky, if I can say, because it, it was a, a proposal that uh, came from the government to, together with us uh, at the FGV as a result of the um, o opposi opposition to the other dra uh, draft uh, cybercrime bill. And it's interesting because you, you start um, a, a process already with the government and civil society together but then, right now, we are facing a very critical moment because this bill got into the Congress. And that's uh, when we will see if the government is really uh, enforcing that uh, process all the way up or not. So it's, um, it's very good, uh, those initiatives. As, as I said, uh, we, the political environment was favorable favorable, favorable uh, mainly because the Minister of Justice uh, is engaged in this kind of uh, activities in, in thinking about using the internet to, to enforce uh, citizenship, but then we have to, to see the, the whole thing and in the front things might change. So it's very positive, but uh, I'm still critic about it. And, and uh, what would your advice be to other countries considering similar uh, sort of uh, rights-based approach or a positive agenda uh, internet policies? Mm. Concerning go government? How to, how to yeah. Uh, yeah, we are t testing. I, I, as you mentioned, it's a new field try to empower citizenships using internet and engaging people. I think uh, one thing that you have to have in mind is also that uh, the offline environment. You, know, you cannot just put, put a consultation online and wait for people to, to engage and debate. There is a, a whole set of activities in the offline environment that must come together in, in terms of either clarifying what, what what's the proposition and and making the marketing of the initiative as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything to add? Yes, how about this, the, this, the engagement of the civil rights frameworks or Marco Civil. 
uh, the Marx view is the expression you use in Brazil. You use it then, you use it for now. Uh, this online engagement that uh, Joana did talk, don't talk about, it. she said about the offline engagement, if offline uh, consultation, it's very important. Just because uh, nowadays uh, it's not make sense we say more online or offline, real or virtual. Uh, every every stuff is making part of the to just own here, I think. But uh, in online space, we understand the communication space. As Castel says, communication is power. We need to understand the new way to make communications. And we, uh, once we understand this new medium or the new space of a communication, we can uh, we can spread our needs and impact the people, impact the persons, uh, and the, the peop these persons could be in engaged on this purpose. For example, on the Mar the, the Marco Civil, uh, the first project on Brazil and the f on the for the first on the world that are uh, uh, published on the website, a special website, on the, uh, where everybody can comment about the bill, comment about the draft of the, draft of the project. It's in on the starter on this, the people that w start working on this engagement for this project was the pro more professional, just um, lawyers, on the others are related to this, activists. Just on the end of the consultation, I observed these normal people make their contribution. This, uh, this could be the understanding of the, the, the Brazilian people that the, the, the whole concept of democracy and the NK make part of this process and they can say everything they want about the, the bill not the technical approach, but because I, I don't uh, understand this or I disagree with this, 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 this point, just because this point could be this way. Uh, when we, we can, um, the question is not about the, the how to, it's about the accessibility of the, 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 the consultation and about the level of the the consultation we need to go. For example, when we, at, we talk, when we, we talk about the communication, we need to understand. For example, for the great media, uh, TV, radio, newspapers, our uh, our communications that were spread for this media was spread for the medium person, not for the intellectuals, and not for the people without the. Uh, the, the low level of intellectuality, just the familiar one. Uh, in the internet, we can f fit on a spectrum much more uh, specific. For example, using the concept of long tail, we can fit the, the, the experts, we can fit the, the, the people that were and the, the beginners of the some kind of stuff. On this uh, is difficult. Uh, it's not the difficult. I, I believe this is turned more this stuff more easier because you need to to engage people in the in different layers, as uh, was told here, uh, in and the different layers and different niches. But the people need to understand in this. There, the, the each niche has our needs, uh, the proper the, the proper needs. That's because. Some needs of the one Nietzsche fits the needs of the other. Why does no, not work together? Just the idea, the idea of to split the, the, the agenda into uh, some parts that the, we can show the Nietzsche, the, the, the whole agenda that fits their needs and engage them. Then on the, the, the practice, it's a, a good way for work for us. Uh, this, this practice is working. And we we plan to uh, to enhance this 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 way for to make activism. 
I, I'm keen to uh, to open this up to the floor, but one final last question to you, Max. Sort of, uh, we, Joanna and Kai have been talking about sort of, um, you know, this sort of combination of, of online and offline consultation right around the democracy field, right? That we have uh, sort of online consultations around the text of the bill and then sort of offline consultations with people around the country. I think in some ways this gets to your question of sort of who are users and what are users. Uh, and I, But I think the sort of larger point I wanted to sort of raise here was, um, you know, you've been sort of doing this from a corporate side, you know, in terms of these terms of service with the, the open, sorry, the Internet and Society Collaboratory. Um, are there any lessons from that sort of experiment that might be used in sort of the more government context and that we might see across uh, sort of entities in terms of engagement? So first of all, I have to uh, clarify that um, <coughs> the Internet and Society Collaboratory is a multi-stakeholder um, uh, think tank. So um, uh, it's uh, uh, actually quite far away from a, 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 c a corporate perspective and uh, more like an IGF type of experience. But um, <coughs> so I can answer um, that in that environment it was uh, particularly easy because um, we have the kind of expert users and um, you know really interested in that kind of uh, experiment participants and therefore a rather small constituency what is much more difficult and where um, actually my, um, my my experience um, is more related to what you're doing is uh, I was the chair of the internet rights and principles coalition that tried to develop such a bill for uh, or that is still continuing to to try because it is um, a, a very long endeavor for um, several years and I think um, it is a combination of, of outreach and getting the messages to a level that uh, you reach the user with. Basically, uh, I think Creative Commons uh, genius lies in the, the division of a human readable um, version and a, a actually legal viable uh, version. So to make the things so easy and, and concrete and, um, and punchy so um, that the no normal people understand it or get interested when they don't understand it because it's uh, somehow not to grasp in, in a second. So I think to um, really break it down to um, uh, things like um, the, the um, uh, flyer, um, uh, flyer rights, the, the passengers' rights in, in airports are uh, one example that uh, have successfully done that. I mean, you have to understand your, your rights in sort of uh, Ten Commandments style without a long um, explanation and a legal education before you understand. The, the Ten Punchy Principles of the Marcus Seville coming soon. Uh, let's uh, let's open this up to the floor. Does anyone uh, have questions? Can, do we <laughs> why, why don't you? Uh, I mean, do we have the mic coming? Just one second, I write it down. Uh, I'm open it. So I have I have three three little and little and fast questions. In fact, the first one is. Sorry, could you identify yourself first? What? Could you, could you say who you are and your affiliation? Oh, okay. My name is Anawak. I'm from Brazil. I'm working in this uh, collective in the northeast of Brazil to realize a very, very interesting free software uh, conference over there. And uh, this is my first time in IGF. So, well, uh, the first question is, is for all of you. Did you realize or can you feel uh, in, the, in the last... Uh, maybe last year, an, an global and coordinated movement uh, from the conservative forces to try to take over internet, over neutrality of the internet, uh, trying to make uh, laws and, and legal uh, movements to to try to stop the the people to express themselves. You see something like that? 
Jillian? I can talk about that later. Well, I have the three questions. It's just fast, and you can answer them in a one. I just don't Let, let's start monopoly. with the one, and then, then so everyone has a chance to speak, okay? Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've written about um, uh, the opposite, a, a global movement of users, right? And I, and I do see that happening, but I think that what's really interesting about that is the way you frame it. I mean, you're absolutely right, yes. And I think that what we're seeing, in fact, is more of a clash than ever before. And I hate to say it, and I'm sure that I'll get DDoSed for saying it, but I think that, <laughs> don't, don't doubt me, um, I think that uh, this is intensified by the rise of hacktivism. I really do. I think that on the one hand, you do have conservative forces pushing against free expression, and that, that was happening already. On the other hand, you've got all of these global forces coming together as a united movement, using the sharing tactics, sharing across borders, and then at the same time, you've got this disruptive force in the middle, and I, I won't say anonymous, I mean, be in a, these many different types of things, this disruptive force in the middle that makes it harder for this side to do their work, and easier for this side to crack down. And I'm not, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm not saying that their work is good or bad. I'm just saying it is clearly disruptive and it is clearly intensifying the efforts from both sides. Um, I have to say that I, I do not think that um, there is a conspiracy by the conservative forces that has unleashed upon us. I think um, you know this is the um, continuous struggle that has uh, happened probably since uh, the Stone Age, and um, I think that some of the means of communication and of sharing knowledge uh, have intensified, but uh, I don't think there has been an, a strategic effort by um, on, the, um, on the side of the conservatives. Uh, this question is interesting just because uh, this year is the, the year of the, the, the conservative forces are working hard. Um, just not because I, I, I'm trying to figure out to, to understand for the reason of that. There was some a kind of theories about this. One the more plausible theory is is the one. For example, uh, the conservative forces don't didn't understanding don't don't understand the internet. Just in the past, they tried to by self to control the internet. We, uh, the, when these don't, they, this, this force, the, let, let's call the force, we need no, 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 not put the name for the force. When this force don't, don't uh, works, don't, the, uh, don't works, they contracted the experts. They're really experts understand the internet. They're really activists understand the internet. When they are con they contracted the experts to work on the way to 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 control the internet, they start finding the answers on the way to do it. For example, I just um, trying to organize the the treats for the internet. Um, I found four arenas on this treats occurs. One arena is the legal one. The legal arena is based on the, the law, bills, or, and the other like this. The other arena is the behavioral arena. The behavioral arena is the arena with the user, uh, for example, for stay more time in the internet, or the internet could be the wall of the garden. Looks like I don't put the names for Waller God. Just Waller guy, guy is on my side. But um, the third one is the technical treat for the internet, the control for the internet, and the last one is the the treat for the the global um, governance of the internet. And this treat we uh, can observe on the the open session. Uh, on the, w, the ITU representative said, to the try to say, uh, try to understand that WCT, the new ITR, will not try to put the internet uh, into the the telecommunication agenda. And this is most the dangerous one for us. What's the reason? I don't know. Max, really quickly. 
Yeah, really quickly. I'm, I'm sure we can agree on many things and, and have great discussions, but I have to say your statement that activists understand the Internet is, um, you know, as um, pauschal, as generalizing as it can get, and I think it's a dangerous one. I think if we want to have a, a real conversation, we should all accept that we don't understand what is going on, and it's certainly not helpful to, you know, come in it with a certain arrogance to say that we are the white knights and we solve the problems. It's actually the exact problem that um, the policymakers have, because they say, you know, these people come in here, but they don't understand about diplomacy, about the uh, complicated the UN system is. I think it's very important that we get it straight, that we all have a lot to learn here, and that th things are not as easy as uh, we think. Claudio? Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Claudio Ruiz, and I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, my name is Claudio Ruiz, uh, and I'm from Derechos Digitales in Chile. And I just have a, a quick question uh, on this auto-regulation auto auto that you were talking at the very, very first beginning about the GNI kind of model and stuff. And I have the feeling that, at least from the third world, uh, uh, it's kind of difficult to just think in that uh, approach as a very good solution for the, prob for the regulation problems on human rights on the Internet, especially because um, it's a model where uh, lacks uh, the more the a very important thing about uh, the uh, the government approach on these topics, uh, which in the third world third world countries at least, uh, it's the most important thing besides the fact of uh, what uh, uh, companies like Google, for instance, or uh, technological uh, companies uh, and local technology technological companies can do uh, for freedom on the internet. So I think it's it's kind of complicated complicated thing and it's make me some noise about it. So my question is, uh, what's the strategy on from this point of view? If the point of view uh, of this uh, multi-stakeholders approach in the third world countries doesn't work quite well, or doesn't work in at least in the same level that the first world countries, the, the quick question is, what do we have to do? And maybe m the first approach uh, is to just think regionally. Maybe that's the first. The, maybe that uh, can be the first. Uh, the first quick answer, at least from the civil society. But I really want to know what do you think about that thing. So I just want to. I want to. I'll let you do that because I, I, I just want to give a quick response um, because I think that I, I, we have these conversations about the Global Network Initiative, and I say this as you know, member organization, happy to be. idea that these American companies don't know what they're getting into in these other countries. And I know I'm simplifying, and I, it's much more complicated than this, but these American companies or Western companies don't know what they're doing in these other countries where the law is very different, and so we need some sort of multi-stakeholder approach where NGOs from these companies uh, or these countries interact with big companies like Google and Yahoo, etc. Now, yes, GNI has evolved. Yes, I'm hoping that it's going in the right direction on some of these things, but honestly, I don't think that it is yet equipped to deal with the types of things that you're saying because we don't have strong representation from outside of the West. We just really don't. And I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to make people trust in the model when the model's not working for them. Um, and I think that there's a great en engagement question here is, how could I engage you as a member of GNI? How could I engage your organization to come in when you don't see how it can serve you? Um, I'm, just to bring it back to the subject of the panel, but I do, I know, I know what you, or I think I know where you're going, and I think you should say it, so please do. So um, I also agree. I mean, this is um, one out of the, the sets that we have uh, when we're talking multi-stakeholder governance. And... Um, uh, uh, group of um, uh, civil society groups and uh, industry has gotten together in uh, Brussels um, about uh, two months ago, I think, um, and they have developed principles on due diligence when it comes to government requests and how to fence them off. And uh, I think that is just the very beginning of um, a movement that we have to drive forward and, um, uh, and push for due diligence for the companies, but also for the, um, uh, uh, for the governments to then follow these uh, principles, but certainly be transparent about what is going on. I couldn't agree more. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, my computer just went dark. Do you remember the address? Um, it was, uh, ask, ask me if you're interested. They are very good principles. Yeah. Brett, and then Carlos. Hi. Uh, 
Hi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, actually, my I didn't really have a question, but uh, but I do have a question. I want to know what the users think, and if there are any tweets or questions from outside of this room. None. <laughs> All right, can we get the mic over to Carlos? Kaf, do you want to just... <laughs> Hi. So... I think this question is for for Max. Max, can you put your headphones on? So, uh, so hi, I'm Carlos Afonso from Getúlio Vargas Foundation. So my question will be something in the lines that Gio was mentioning that some of us are like the children of Napster. So we end up like growing up with a different take on the idea of content and how do you handle content and that will take us to, I think, a very important uh, uh, question for not only for Google, but for internet companies as a whole, which is what happens when you have a situation in which the discourse, the corporate discourse, is pretty much connected to the protection of a fundamental right that the users feel that they could have in that specific company, someone who could champion this specific rights or this specific cause. This can happen, but the quite opposite can happen as well. So the same thing that we see in Google and that we saw during the SOPA and PIPA debate in which on the, the, the conflict that we end up having between, that's a, a simple way to, to, to frame the SOPA and PIPA case, but you have on one side content industry and the other side tech companies and the users feeling like the tech companies could push forward their causes, quite the opposite could happen. And I would say like privacy is the first example that comes to my mind in which the corporate interest can be against what the user would want to see being played out by the company. So my question is, and this uh, of course is a very like broad question, but how can a company and how can a tech company in a situation like this one in which conflicts with other uh, sectors of the business constituency, like the content industry, for instance, may come up and become even more serious. How could tech companies win consumer trusts, could win the attention of the users and really enforce and push forward some human rights that would advance some causes that are important for the users? I know this is a very broad question. I'm really sorry about that as we are running out of time, but just to have your take on that. Thank you. Yeah, as you say, it's a, it's a difficult one. Um, uh, and uh, it's also difficult to share with you all my secret tactics that I'm applying to try to have Google stand up more for human rights, etc. cetera. But um, I think one um, idea that uh, I think is quite promising is the same way that um, Google has 10, 10 principles um, they believe to be true in terms of developing products, etc. Um, uh, they can also subscribe to principles in terms of policy making and um, that could be one way to really hold them up. I mean, this don't be evil um, uh, um, bon mot, if you want, uh, has caused the company to uh, feel a, a duty that is maybe higher than the duty of other companies to really stick to um, uh, what they're, what they're um, uh, saying. And um, besides that, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a variety of, um, uh, of possibilities. In the end, um, the, the good thing is that uh, the users are in the driving seat, and um, uh, if they um, show that they're preferring, um, uh, you know, um, uh, privacy practices or other human rights related practices, then uh, companies are very fast to adopt. I think um, 
it's uh, similar to what um, Jillian said um, uh, when you do a campaign um, uh, if the, the pain for the company is not there it, um, it will opt for um, uh, the, the way of least resistance and that is of course in many ways that they prefer to um, maximize the, the possibilities for innovation and to develop the product further so um, uh, yeah I'm, I'm happy to continue the <laughs> conversation offline I think we're we're about. To it looks like the uh, the next panel is here, so I think we're unfortunately going to have to end there and don't don't have quite time for for closing thoughts. But uh, I think we'll be hanging around for a little bit afterwards. Um, thank you all. Thank you to our panelists and to our audience and uh, facilitators and remote participants. And uh, enjoy the rest of your IGF.